there are folks who comment with things that are factually incorrect. For example, we had somebody comment that, you know, I don't want to deal with withdrawing during the crazy swings of the market up and down. Just let the dividends throw the income that you need to live. Well, guess what changes with the price of the stock? Yep. It's the dividends. <laughs> Two lifelong friends document and share their personal stories as they seek financial independence and to retire early. One reaches fire in 2020 during a global pandemic, inspiring the other to play catch up. This is Two Sides of Fi. So it's only been a couple of days, Eric, since we released the episode where we had Karsten Yeski uh, as the guest, as often happens with his blog posts. You know, we see the people come out of the woodwork with comments. And some of them are excited about the sort of power of the toolkit that he put together. Others are ready to come forward with controversy, whether it's about the dividend investing strategy or anything else that we talked about. In we kind of trolled that though, man. We, we, <laughs> we kind of set that up. That was All a right, little, that one maybe. That was yeah. a little honey, honey pot. <laughs> we, might, we might be tired about answering comments about dividends, but you know, first of all, we wanna maybe put our own context around some of the feedback that we got. But on the same note, um, just speak to some of the questions that came up. And one of the first things that came to mind is this story uh, towards the very end of my pre-fi period where um, I had been using Karsten's Safe Withdrawal Rate Toolkit a good deal, reading all his blog posts. You know, It was quite an effort to get through them. And I, at that time, was working with financial advisors. And I sent that whole series on safe withdrawal rate to them, you know, <laughs> thinking they'll just have a look at it because, uh, you know, I was clearly asking questions about it. But in fact, they read the whole thing to their credit. And we had a great discussion about it. It really helped frame up what we already had been discussing about my withdrawal rate once I stopped working. And um, it was a really important piece of the puzzle um, towards my FI journey, but it certainly wasn't the whole thing. I really value, and I believe you really value, the work in the Early Retirement Now uh, blog post that Carson has written over the years, the toolkit, but it's only one piece of our FIRE context. I mean, do you agree with that point? Yeah, and the first time I actually I cracked that open, I was super intimidated. And one of the things I noticed <laughs> the, in the, the comments for that video was like, hey, I'm glad I'm in the messy middle, so I don't have to dig into this now. And it's just interesting to see myself maybe six or eight months ago when I did the very same thing. I had the same reaction, and I'm actually getting closer to this transition point than that person was. I think they were in their 20s, the person who made that comment. And the fact is, you, like, there's going to come a day when you actually have to get to that point. And so actually taking some time with that, toolbox and spreadsheet and sitting down with it and, and just like carving out an hour to, to really try and understand it. It's actually, he's done all the hard work for you. Yeah. There's actually very few things you have to input into it. And I like that it flips this whole having to calculate a safe withdrawal rate, the 4% rule on its head. You know, it looks yeah. at an end goal. I want to preserve 50% of my capital or a hundred percent of my capital. And then it tells you, Hey, based on this historical data, this is the safe withdrawal rate, like a fail safe withdrawal rate. And yes. to me, that's just, that's a much more logical way of thinking about it. It's a total rethink than where we all start off at the 4% rule, like withdrawal rate. Is that where you started the conversation with your financial advisors? Like, Hey, why isn't this like just 4% rule? And we use that, you know, the inverse of that to come up with, a, with the uh, asset balance that we need to use. Yeah, it was definitely part of it. You know, what we were talking about for withdrawal rate was actually a little lower than I was originally thinking. And so this framework uh, and the, the writing that Carson has done provided really good context for that conversation, because frankly, I understood a lot better why they were guiding me towards below three and a half percent withdrawal rate at that time. Maybe it just made me enable to ask better questions, yeah. frankly, in addition right. to giving me the more confidence. But I, I kind of like what you said, if I could step back about this, you know, starting with this four percent journey. Uh, that was kind of like the start of it for me uh, once I understood the FIRE community existed, right? Yeah. But then I, I went where a lot of our readers went in the comments, and that was, well, this withdrawal rate thing, it's a little complicated. I'm going to go to the expenses level, right? This kind of bottoms up building of a withdrawal strategy versus a top down. You know, In other words, what do I need versus what's the maximum I could spend? And so I did spend a lot of energy on developing expense models and you know the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves and then the occasional lumpy spending. And that's great stuff. What's important and where I got a little tripped up in some of the comments we got is it's not an either-or. 
It's yeah. not this idea that, right. well, safe withdrawal rate, that's obtuse and it, it's maybe not logical or it's too complex. I'm just going to go the other direction. Right, I right. actually looked at it as once I did that work with expense modeling, tools like the safe withdrawal rate toolbox helped me kind of, number one, have more confidence that I was going to be good to cover the expenses I was projecting and the things I wanted to spend, right, the nice to haves. But also just it's a totally – I think you made this comment talking to Karsten. It's just another approach that kind of adds value to the whole equation. I mean I like this because I think about how I design houses. So we go out to the to a site and we look at the topography and where the sun is and how we're going to site this house according to views and wind and all of these different characteristics, right? And you have this kind yeah. of overall heuristic that you're using to design the home. And then you get into some of the details and you realize, okay, well, some of those assumptions I made initially, like, not quite right. Like, you know, I understand that the kitchen may yeah. actually want to face the stream here as opposed to just capturing morning light. And those two things are in opposition. And so I think there's this constant iterative process. You go down one avenue and you see what the limiting forces are there. And then you sort of pull back and you say, oh, yeah, but there's also this. And you kind of dig into that avenue and you discover something new and different. And that is really how I see this journey. I mean, if I go back and rewind to some of the earlier episodes, you know, I can and see how naive I was about certain things. And that's just like, it's just part of this. And it's I feel, all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like digging into the real granular stuff, which Karsten's information is very, it can be tough to digest just because he's just throwing all this information at you at a really high level. And so yeah. in some sense, I can see that reaction saying, Hey, this withdrawal rate thing is just too overwhelming for me. But, yeah. you know, as I was saying, like if you spend a little bit of time with it and it sounds like you read every one of the posts in his series. And I still I have yet to do that. Um, but if you take some time with it, there is this kind of accretion of knowledge that helps you to start make, make asking better questions, you know, becoming a, a more informed consumer of, you know, this plan that you're developing for retirement. And so that I really appreciate having, being able to look at it from the expense side, but also from the, like a, a fail safe withdrawal rate side and yeah, how totally. that might be tied to, the Cape ratio or whatever else, you know, a, a variable withdrawal rate. Um, yeah. so I, I like that kind of reframing of it. There was, there was a question in there that mentioned uh, the 4% rule and yes. sort of how everyone is talking about how it doesn't work anymore. Um, but I, I kind of want to unpack that a little bit. Yeah. It's a really good one. I think you and I have been pretty open from the beginning that the 4% rule is the 4% rule of thumb, I try to call it, right, like a lot of people right. do. It's a really great directional and, and you know, order of magnitude type um, calculation. And especially early on your journey, it's such an easy way to think about how much money might I need, right? 25 times my projected future expenses. Um, and I'm not saying that's an easy exercise to figure out what your future expenses are, but that's really a tractable exercise, right? You can think about what I spend now and what I might spend in the future and refine it over time and just multiplying that by 25x, for example, for the 4% rule, pretty straightforward. But on the same note, it's just a rule of thumb. There's a lot of caveats associated with it. And, you know, you and I have never tried to go point by point and challenge the original study, the Bengen work, then the Trinity study, then the revamp. And then he wrote about it some more and yada, yada, yada. Right. That's not our training. Other people enjoy doing that a lot more than we do. But I've talked about from the beginning why I have a lower withdrawal rate. And I think. How would I put this? Um it's a starting point. There's more work to be done. There are people who, with their own individual risk tolerance, although I think many ignore risk capacity, um, believe a higher withdrawal rate towards four makes sense. And of course, as I think Carson even said, when he talked to us, there are people who might be older in retirement or have other streams of income like a pension or, or real estate or something where they could withdraw at more than 4%. Or so, if you're retiring at the bottom of a, you know, a bear market. Right. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed so, to the top of a bull market. So it's, it yeah. is that this is a place where nuance really comes into play and you, it does. And the 4% rule is kind of like, I think you and I kind of jettisoned that pretty early on, but it, it's also one of those confusing nameplates that I feel, I mean, it's unfortunate that it, that it, has as much sort of notoriety because the the four percent rule tends to get carried dragged along the the path to phi i feel like a lot longer than it than it needs to be because yeah i mean if you actually dig into what that is it it is 
it is almost the worst thing from a sequence of returns risk standpoint that you can do, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, just just blindly withdraw at that rate, a fixed, irrespective of market conditions or right. anything else. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that's the one thing you know. If you read Wade Fow or Kitsis or you know Carson's work, it's, right, it's all cites that. I mean, that's that level of research is required here before you just say, Hey, 4%, no problem. You know, because 4% of a portfolio in a, at the top of a bull market versus 4% of a portfolio at the bottom of a bear market, like very different. Right. Yeah. I know. I think that's an excellent point. I, I think there's also something to be said about the beauty of simplicity and, in, 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 in spreading a message That's true. Yeah. is equally a danger that. that becomes a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, there's a reason many of us have read and enjoyed and passed on things like The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins, right? It's just so straightforward. It makes perfect sense. The concepts in there are completely valid. But some people take that simplicity of message to mean that anything other than that is stupid, yeah. right? If you're not just all VTSAX or VTSAX plus a you know X percent international, um, you're doing it wrong. And, and that's crazy. To me, that's just as crazy as, although less expensive, having some overly architected portfolio with 50 different funds and all sorts of crazy investments. Like neither of those is correct and is the best thing for everybody. There is more nuance to it. There's plenty of room for, you know, some flexibility there. But the simplicity of a message can also become equally just let it spread like a meme. Yeah, and, and, and mean that nothing else is good. I don't know if that's just my opinion, but it's something I've felt at times. I mean, I did find myself quoting the 4% rule with people who are just like, I explained to somebody uh, two weekends ago, they wanted to know, you know, about this kind of early retirement thing. Hey, yeah. oh, tell me about that. And that that's one of the opening conversations is always like, well, 25 X, like, what do you spend a year? Do you spend a hundred grand a year? You need two and a half million. Like, that's just a guard rate. It's an opening, you know, paint the yeah. picture kind of, draw somebody into this or I mean, hopefully draw somebody into it. It's like, okay, well that, that may seem more attainable and more manageable than, um, you know, something else, which is far more complex. Like the level of detail that we got into with Karsten. It's like, I mean, that's, that can't be the opening salvo in the conversation. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> Right. Like, yeah. Uh, that's fair. This isn't for me, but yeah, yeah, I get the, I get the idea. And it becomes a weird thing, right? Because there are those who feel they they really have to defend that 4% number because it's their present plan, right? But right. uh, well, here's four references that show that it's never failed. And you know, some of those are just lacking context. Some of those are oversimplified. That's not a judgment against somebody who's saying that. They want to believe it. And look, we are all subject to biases no matter what we do. And confirmation bias is a very real one. And you can find source after source that will tell you, you know what, 4% completely safe. It cannot fail because of all these reasons. But there are folks who are far better trained than you and I are in this area. Carson's just one of them, not saying he's the be all end all, but who have done the work, done the modeling, provided the context with their educated standpoint said, well, you know, guys, here's why yeah, the data. 4% will not work out all the time for everybody. And here's some things you should think about, which to me, that's a very reasonable position. Yeah, and it's. I think Carson used the words like lazy. You're being kind of lazy. He was talking about a financial <laughs> yes. advisor that he was having a back and forth with on Twitter. And yeah, yeah there, there is, you can take this heuristic too far. For sure. <laughs> like it's just, a, it's not an operational principle. It has to be like an individualized plan here once you get pretty deep into yeah. the fire path. It does, totally. it does make me think in some respects though, you and I are, you know, kind of self-styled bogleheads, I guess I'd, Call us. I mean, yeah. is that in, fair? In recent years, I've become much more so. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't always appreciate the simplicity and low fee sort of standpoint, and now I absolutely do. But but essentially, we are operating like portfolios from a total return standpoint, and that has a certain, you know, we're developing a diversified portfolio of assets, and we're comfortable with making you know, changes in allocation or changes in how we divvy up our money in each one of those buckets. We've talked about the bucket strategy before, but there yeah. are people who see it differently. And they I do. see, yeah. I see the dividend investors coming in <laughs> into play. I mean, they're definitely, that's comments. what I was just thinking too. <laughs> we expected those comments on that video we because we kind of, you know, we set it up that way, but, um, it, it's also, you know, you and I just talked to a financial advisor who said, we talked to the same one and he recommended a SPIA single premium immediate annuity. And that is another flavor 
of, you know, I mean, it's not a total return portfolio. It's basically saying, hey, take some of your bond allocation. And if you want a fixed income that's going to come to you and on a repeatable stream over time, yeah, take part of your bond allocation and turn it to that. And you and I, I think we both thumbed our nose at that. Yeah. But that's like, it's actually... The more I think about it, it's a pretty reasonable strategy. In fact, my dad, it just, is. he just converted his portfolio to an annuity and he's at a different age and he's got a different, you know, different actua actuarial tables, you know, yeah. apply to him than they do to you and I and our retirement horizons are much different. But it, it does make me think, you know, when we see these comments and everyone, and you said this earlier, like everyone say, my plan is the best way. Yeah. It doesn't have to way. be that way. No. But I do get my back up a little bit when someone comes in at me with the, the whole dividend thing. It's like, hey, man, you're just being dumb here. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, I, I feel like I'm being accused of being stupid yes. sometimes because they say, you know what? If you don't see that having your dividends throw off the money you spend and you never touch, never touch the principal, well, obviously you're dumb. Um, th that's not great. Uh, you know, you mentioned Wade Fowl before. You probably heard him talk about it. But have you looked into or taken, is it called the RISA? That yeah. tool that he developed with the other yeah. individual, I don't remember his name, uh, sorry. Well, let's pop it up on the screen. That tool is great because it looks not only at your you know, portfolio needs, uh, it also has risk tolerance built in. And so- It's like you a know, style, man, right? It's, it, 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 yeah, it's it a overlays, style, right? It, I think there's, is it four different styles that he comes up with? I think there's four primary quadrants and there's you know different degrees of where you mm -hmm. land based on this questionnaire. Right. It's very simple. Definitely something we're going to put in the show notes. But um, you know, a SPIA can make perfect sense for people who are much more risk averse right. than you and I are, right? right? I'm more risk averse than you are, at least at this point, right? I, I seem to turn towards the more conservative. And yet, when I did that tool, I didn't end up in the, you should really consider an annuity to, you know, to cover your dignity floor, some people call it, right? You know, your core expenses, yeah. you, no matter what, you unquestionably will be able to meet, you know, an annuity is a great way to meet those. That's not for me, but that's a totally valid decision for some other people. And that financial advisor was absolutely right in suggesting it as one of the possible options, but it's not the only option. And I doubt Karsten would disagree that that's a perfectly fine strategy for other people as long as they've accounted for it properly in their withdrawal. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of part part of how part of the sort of rationale that people use to justify their position. It, it, they're kind of misquoting information. They're not including that happens. They're not including fees in general. Yeah. They're not including some of the negative aspects of holding some of these funds and. Yeah. You know, it's impossible, I guess. Well, it's hard to predict opportunity cost as well. But True. I mean, th this does come down to an individual risk profile and what you're comfortable with and what you're optimizing for. Um, but I, man, there was a few comment replies in there from Karsten that I was like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he's got, look, he's got the training to back it up. Many oh, people sure. aren't yeah. aware what a chartered financial analyst is and how difficult that that level of certification is to get. But if he's telling you things about uh, about different assets, he's probably right. Uh, <laughs> they're very complex, the, and that, that is not the training you and I have. But on the same note, there are folks who come in and comment with things that are factually incorrect, or at least they're their not understanding is not complete. For example, we had somebody comment that, you know, I don't wanna deal with withdrawing during the crazy swings of the market up and down. Just let the dividends throw the income that you need to live. Well, guess what changes with the price of the stock? Yep. It's the dividends, <laughs> if they're go. even still offered. So I guess the thing I get most of all is not upset, it's concerned. Because you know, not everybody discloses where they are on their journey when right. they say these things. I don't know if they're already withdrawing and this is their strategy, or they have skin in the game, they have something to sell, like a system or whatever. I, I hope it's that stuff because then I'm not worried about their money and their well-being as much. But, you know, people do come in with things that are, you know, very strongly held opinions that have incorrect bases. And that's where I that's where I start to get worried. Yeah. And it's I mean, it's a, very difficult to have these conversations in the comments section of any social media site. But, you know, YouTube especially. Um, yeah. Where, like you said, you don't have the context. And you, I mean. How about the tax implications of a dividend strategy? Like, well, let's have that discussion, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you, t you sent me a text after the Karsten episode. You and I were just having a conversation and you were just saying, you know, between speaking with Karsten 
and this other conversation you and I had, like I'm feeling a lot more confidence in the plan. So what, what changed when you were listening to Karsten about, because you asked him a very pointed question about your yeah. withdrawal rate and I did. you felt like you were being too conservative, right? Yeah. So what changed? It's interesting because it's equally a change and it's equally a revisiting of something I felt before. And what I didn't say in my story earlier is that when I went to my then financial advisors with you know, what I was getting out of the toolbox and the posts, I started to feel really confident about the plan because I just looked at it as more data from another source, right? Yeah. I'm a scientist. Confirming the more data. data you get from differing sources with different biases and interests, the more confident I'm going to feel. You could be confidently wrong, of course, but <laughs> the point is when we had this conversation with him you know, just a couple weeks ago, it reminded me of the work I had done before. It forced me as part of my homework for that episode to go back and read those posts, to go back to the calculator, which I did again after our call, after we recorded that, I went and did more modeling again um, <laughs> with the current state of the portfolio. And it just made me feel a lot better because it's like, you know, I've been down this road before, but now it's been two to three years or more since I really dug into that tool. And here I am again, just sort of reminding myself of, oh, this feels good. I can look at this section where it shows, you know, kind of some of the worst cohorts in history, you know, people who retire, if they retired around the Great Depression or in the early 1970s or, you know, 2008, you know, just looking at those data in the context of me now being um, withdrawing for more than two years, yeah. it's more data. So it's going to make me feel more comfortable. And I was thankful. But also, I, for I'm going to interrupt you here because you're going Yeah, go on. ahead. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I ramble on. Everybody knows. <laughs> it now. You just edit me well. <laughs> so there's also the idea that you wanted to keep twisting the dials, man. <laughs> and I, and it, it's all optimization, man. It, right. And I, what I said to you was like, kind of already won the game. And, and yeah. I think Karsten said a you know, a piece of that to you too, but I don't think he you did. I don't think you took it in the same way. I probably I think, didn't. I think you took it in like, Ooh, I should go back in. I should dip back into this and start. No, <laughs> start no, messing I with the dials, right? I will tell you <laughs> that, that that has not been an outcome of our conversation where I feel the need to dial up. Honestly, it's how I've answered a couple of comments since the episode was released. And that is I'm comfortable with my withdrawal rate currently, knowing that I have ample room if I need or want to increase it for some reason down the road. And that's a special trip for an anniversary or a gift or, you know, very bad market conditions and selling when I would rather not, right? Emotionally, I don't want to sell, but the data are showing me this prediction that I'll be okay. And so the fact that I'm withdrawing lower and, and clearly he acknowledged that he does too. He even, you know, yeah. I, I even quoted him, on, not directly quoted. I even mentioned that he had written about this previously yeah. and, and he agreed. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, if you're able to, right? And that's, again, a privileged position. If you're able to save sufficiently so that you can withdraw lower than you, you know, absolutely could, that's a great place to be because you've got more flexibility. So I did get I, confidence on that. No, yes. I didn't go back and feel like, well, now I'm going to crank it up a little higher. I have kept everything the same. I had, I had two moments in there that were nice. I mean, aside okay. from the moment where he said, Hey, I still think you're going to be able to retire in 2024. I, I loved that one. I expected <laughs> to see like rainbows coming out. of. Yeah. The screen. I was <laughs> like, I told Laura, I went right inside after the interview that day. I was like, Oh, he he thinks we, we might have it. Here's why. We're still but, good. We're still good. Um, <laughs> without him knowing anything about our current financial yeah, situation, that's right. which yeah. is funny. But um, aside from that, um, two two things. The first was the bucket strategy. And I loved just hearing him say, just talk about the fact that it was window dressing because I've, I've read that post before, yep. but hearing him talk through that. And I don't, I don't know if you've felt that same way, but I immediately thought, you know, fast forwarded to your situation where, okay, your cash bucket is, is going down, right? It's, I know it's full right now, but yeah. at the point, because you do use the bucket strategy at the yeah. point where that, you know, gets low enough where you have to start thinking about, okay, well, how do I rebalance? Cause effectively that's what it is. Right. Yeah. He was just basically saying, look, it's set, put a system in place, take yes. the emotion out of it. And I had I was always thinking, and I, I feel like you must have been thinking of this too, that I'm making an emotional timing. I'm going to time yes. the market here. Yeah. And he's just saying, you're not, Don't. you can't win like that. I mean, you could, 
you yeah. can get lucky, but it, but it is, it's a fool's game. Yeah, you're totally right. And uh, if you go back and rewatch that footage, you'll you'll probably see the light bulb going off above my head. <laughs> I acknowledged that I need to have a system in place for the timing of those sales, and I presently do not. It's yeah, not in my yeah. IPS. You know, it is my strategy to sell to refill cash. And I think Fritz Gilbert acknowledges this very openly as well, that this is a part of it's an element of your normal rebalancing and asset allocation strategy. But for me personally, I don't have it systematized that right. I'm going to sell twice a year or quarterly. And this is how it is, um, you know, and that that's kind of illogical because I have my rebalancing frequency set up and it should be a part of the same exercise irrespective. So but that was here I'm, I'm going to push me. back on you right now. Like, OK, right now, let's say you had the policy in place and it said, yep. OK, you got to sell some assets. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? I'll do it. Uh, I, I mean, I've got positions that are a little heavy that have gains in them. Um, so, it, it, you know, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to take so a tax not, hit, for example. You're or, not selling bonds? Um, it, well, right now, actually, there's a couple different things I could do, including selling bonds. Yes. I mean, to, I, that, to, to be within my targets. Yeah. Nothing that, is out of range right now per my 20 percent relative. No, I know. But uh, I'm doing bands. I'm running a hypothetical exercise. Oh, OK. Like, OK. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so, you know, it, we're beaten up in the market here and you got to make yep. it. You have to follow your system. Yes. What do you do? I'll sell bonds. You're going to sell bonds, right? Yep, absolutely. I mean, that has to be the answer. I'm Give, OK with that. I given am okay this with condition, that. the current market condition, that has to be the answer. Yes. And your portfolio, right? Yeah, I've got a little bit of REITs I could sell, too. OK, right. And so, I mean, it's just interesting to me that there can still be this argument. It's like, why hold bonds? You know? I, I mean, I that's their diversifying asset. That, yeah. That's it, right? And, and it the way my portfolio is set up, which other people can challenge all they want, right. that's totally valid. I'm not saying this is the way, but this is my way. Um, so yeah, I would, I would be selling some intermediate treasuries or total bond fund. Yeah, okay, cool. So that, I was going to say the second um, sort of nice thing about that episode that happened for me was um, – him helping me rethink how I might unwind my asset allocation, oh, yeah. like a uh -huh. little too conservative, you know, he's like, well, if you wanted to walk it back up to closer to a hundred percent, this is what you could do. And I would do yeah. it incrementally. And I loved that because it's just, it's, it's a great system that anyone can apply almost at any point in their journey. Like you decide sure. you want a little more bond, like you don't have to jump all in. Like I was yeah. jumping all in. <laughs> You were. And, you know, from a, a total return perspective, it turned out to be a fortuitous move, uh, you know, but you're also that's also a small time interval that we're talking about here. Right. Since the beginning of the year versus you're still thinking about, well, if I'm two years out or more and I don't want to be at this high of a bond allocation, is it reasonable to do otherwise? And so I think that was a very good discussion. Yeah. And so now I guess now I have to figure out what the actual numbers are what, what we're actually going to do, you know, yeah. I'm going to walk it back to 80 or what I'm going to do, but, um, and how long a period I'm going to wait to do that. Cause I'm just looking at the market and like, well, I don't see a way that this is bad. I mean, yeah. if market keeps going down, it's just like, I don't know, on dollar cost averaging into it. I, I, I guess that's probably not the technical term for it, um, necessarily, but I'm reallocating. So yeah, it's not that's dollar right. cost averaging, but <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Yeah. I was kind of intimidated speaking to him. Yeah, it is tough, right? It's always tough when uh, you're talking with somebody who just knows so much more about a topic than you do, right? It's the, it's the opposite of the advice I always gave people who were going to give, you know, scientific talks or, you know, marketing talks for the first time. I say, you know, the thing that always made me feel confident is if you're out there talking about a thing, you probably know more about your <laughs> angle on that thing than the people you're talking to. So you should feel good about it. When we talk to him, it's like, there is literally nothing that we know more about than him when it comes to this topic, except for our exact portfolios and like how we think about them. It's, you know, we're not going to win <laughs> in an argument about different investing strategies. No, it is. It's funny. Uh, if, if you are listening to this on the podcast and you haven't been to the YouTube video, at least go and check out the comments because he was gracious enough to take the time to reply totally. to a number of people with some really high level information that Jason and I would never be able to replicate uh, yeah. ourselves. And it's, I just have to say that, I mean, huge thanks to him for doing that, but also coming out of that, 
gave me a boost of confidence using those tools. And I mean, if there's any doubt about his knowledge on the subjects of safe withdrawal rates, go read that. 50, how many parts are in the series now? It's yeah. at least 53. Yeah. I mean, just go check that out and, and read it because it's just, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and it's accessible in a lot of ways. It's ac accessible in the important ways, which is yes. testing, you know, this is another device and tool to test your plan. And it's not, yeah. it's not the only one you need to use, but it's a really good one. I'm actually, I'm really glad. I think you put that really well, Eric, the, because, you know, we did get a couple of pieces of feedback that, you know, I understand them where they basically say, I looked at this thing, it's completely overwhelming. Yeah. And so I moved on. Yep. And in my comment, you know, paraphrasing myself here was something like, you know, don't get hung up on the math. He says numerous times or he writes numerous times in his articles, you know, and this is for the math nerds or whatever. And, and then he goes another level deeper. You don't necessarily have to understand all the mathematics of, you know, the, the matrix algebra that's involved in his modeling. But he, he lays out his givens very clearly. He explains the outcomes of different scenarios. And that's just not always the case with different tools that are out there. And so even if you run a lot of other simulations or used other software that you're very happy with, one of the things that I think is valuable is, you know, using something like Safe Withdrawal Rate Toolbox, seeing how the answers match up or they're different. And then here you can at least understand his assumptions and givens and his, his methods and decide, well, either that is something that I understand now and it makes sense to me or, um, you know what, there, there's another way I think about it. But yeah. I, I would say don't get overwhelmed by the math and the modeling and the graphs because – there's plenty of text that explains, I think, the take homes really well. Yeah, I mean, it, he did point out some of the the problems with doing like the Monte Carlo analysis on things, which yeah. a lot of these calculators, you know, with just a few radio buttons do, is that it's not accurately showing how markets recover, right? Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that's right. That has a big impact on what... <laughs> your portfolio looks like over time. Totally. And so, yeah, I mean, I get the idea that, okay, this looks too complex, but there's the opposite end of the spectrum, which is this is overly simplified to the point of not being useful and actually yeah. not being applicable to your situation. I mean, you don't know it, it, They're all somewhat of a black box, right? So you yeah, don't know the machinery behind there unless you have a deeper level of understanding. And I think he gave a lot of credit to Seafire Sim and you and I both yeah. said we both use Absolutely. use that and continue to use that because it's it's like the four percent rule. It's kind of like this broad brush system. You can look at it, dip into it, understand things, run some tests and models, and then, you know, approach it from a different angle and try something else and see, you know, where these things all come together and coalesce into a plan you're comfortable with. But I have to say, I mean, someone asked me like, well, do you feel more confident after talking to him or less confident in, you know, your retirement date of 2024? And I was like, more confident. I mean, yeah. as opposed to the financial advisor that I talked to who said 3.3% withdrawal rates, just not going to work. Like, That's right. well, he didn't say it's not going to work. No, has a he high didn't. chance of failure. And, like that's, that's meaningless to me without having yeah. the data there. And, you know, we, when you're able to put your data into the calculator and the tool sheet, the toolbox, you get to see and play with the dials and see what changes you need to make or feel confident in how it's going to work. Yeah. You know, I, I find myself thinking, you know, when I went back and I, I watched the episode again, when it was, once it was released and now we're sitting here having this conversation, I, I keep having the same thought and it's, you know, we don't have a lot of guests on this show. You know, th this show is about you and I and our journey and the things we're learning along the way and, you know, questioning each other on the things we've learned. But when we do have a guest, it's because they're bringing a perspective that we don't have or skills that, that we yeah. have not, do not possess. <laughs> and a lot of that is to just expose different ways of thinking from people who are living it and, and have done this already, right? Fritz is farther out on his post RE spectrum than I am. So is Karsten. They have different backgrounds, different systems, if you will, of thinking. It was pretty great that they were commenting to each other yeah. uh, on our video. We just try to find value in talking with people who we think, you know, others can learn from. And I, I think for me, that's super rewarding when I feel like you and I are benefiting and we've called out the ways you and I have benefited from that conversation. But also are hopeful that others are seeing the value in that. The, the thing about the typical fire or five podcast 
is it's just speaks in generalities. It's like, yeah, what do you do as a 20 year old when you're trying to save here? And I feel like it's the specifics that paint the true picture yeah. and give, allow somebody to relate to the experience because you and I, you know, we have different portfolios and we have different balances and we're different living in different places and a lot of things that are different about us, but I can learn from those situations like the bucket strategy rethink and actually having a system for selling and taking the emotion out of it. It's like, that's huge yeah. for me. I mean, I think a totally. lot of people can learn from that just in the same way that like, if you want to make an al asset allocation change, do it gradually. You don't have to do it all at yeah. once. I feel like there it's those lessons painted in our own stories that are probably more valuable for people. Yeah. And it's like, I, that's what I'm continuing to try and think about and search for. Um, for rather sure. Than just say 4% rule. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, and honestly, I, I think, you know, I really liked the way that you elected to start our conversation with Karsten. You 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 were immediately went to from the simple to the nuanced. And that is exactly what I think about when I view our conversations here. Yeah, there's a very, you know, there are some simple strategies that people use and, and should use to think about achieving their financial independence. But when it comes to like the realities of the decisions we make immediately leading up to and once you're uh, starting to withdraw, that's all nuance and it's individual. And I don't think enough of that gets sufficient airtime. I want to see now, speaking of detail, I want to see what your, how your IPS is going to change. Yeah, I will honestly, I, I will go on record <laughs> here and say that we should do an episode about our investing policy statements and I will gladly show mine. And you will see in there that this is described. I just copied yours. No, sorry, you got to change it. I want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them into the uh, that tool that tells if you, uh, you know, plagiarized That's it. Right. We're gonna see. What's the so? But you, you said you didn't have it specifically. No, I. But I'm gonna put it in there. Oh, okay. And, you're gonna add I'll, it. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold myself to task. You're, you're not gonna let you. You haven't let me off easy on anything in 36 years. So I don't think you're gonna let me slide if, if I don't have a art cleanly articulated. I, I gotta tell you though, honestly, if I show my IPS, I'm so paranoid that somebody like, oh yeah, you know, a Karsten or another financial advisor is gonna look at it and be like, "Here's why you're an idiot," <laughs> um, and, and not that any of them are mean people, but I just, uh, I don't know, I just have this fear that I'm just it's not. Worked, it's worked for you so far, man. I mean, it's working. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate when you remind <laughs> Can't me. Can't with that. You know, you've already won the game. Stop trying to optimize, but you, know, you just have a lot more free time once you stop working. I think I just love these the thinking about little optimizations, even if they're not gonna impact on the uh on the big picture yeah well, that's who you are and and you know yeah. don't take the fun out of it but also don't waste your time on it